darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now. The Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I am excited about this program today, the conversation we're going to have. Um, It is vitally, vitally, vitally important that we refuse to allow ourselves to simply be passive consumers of the messages, the narratives, and the perspectives that the world intends to foist upon us, but that we Uh, apply ourselves to the trade that God has made requisite for the believer as articulated in his holy word. We're going to get to that in a moment. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making your transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income, transitioning from that to your full-time jobs. Yes, I describe your income generation engagement as your part-time jobs because it is simply a part Of what you do. Our society works feverishly to push you into thinking first and then acting as if your occupation is supreme in your existence, even to get you to conflate your identity with what you do to generate revenue. But your identity is not based on particular activities that you do, your identity is anchored in the one who created you. Your full time jobs as well as my full-time job, is outcome cultivation. If you have been born again, you have been called into ministry. That is not a, a fanciful romanticizing of your salvation. It is a simple reality. If God desired for you to be instantly in his fully manifested presence, he would simply save you and take you home to be with him immediately. But it is his divine prerogative that he has deposited his ambassadors in this world to light up the darkness. Our assignment to full-time work is to make disciples. That disciple-making includes the proclamation of the gospel, that souls may be saved, that people may be born again, that people may be regenerated by the Spirit of God. But salvation is not the end of the story. It actually is the beginning. (laughs) The Apostle Paul explains in Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, that prior to regeneration, we were dead in trespasses and sins. That death is a pronouncement as to the reality of our eternal spiritual condition. But being born again, we are quickened alive together in Christ Jesus. That begins the newness of life. That newness of life is undergirded by the sanctifying process in which it is our Lord's design that a little bit more mature, not a little bit, but more mature seasoned believers comes al- come alongside those who are newly born again to aid them in the disciple-making process to where they are trained, taught, prepared, sharpened, and equipped to be disciplined learners of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would add disciplined, lifelong learners committed to obedience to obey all that Jesus Christ has commanded us. And so the disciple-making process continues. Hence, my description of it as our full-time jobs. Every believer is called to participate in the Great Commission's execution. Every believer. We have got to get out of this mindset to where we kind of established an ecclesiastical hierarchy in our minds. To when we see the Bible says that the saints are to be equipped for the work of the ministry, we, we unintentionally edit that to say so that the preachers on Sunday mornings in the pulpit can be equipped for the work of the ministry. It's the saints, all of our Lord's called out ones. That is what we're supposed to be about. So at this very moment, as you're making your transition to your full time job, starting in your home. Starting in your home. I want to remind you what I do on a daily basis. What happens in your house is far more important than what goes on in the White House. Welcome to the program. I am Abraham Hamilton, the third. The show is the Hamilton Corner. We are on deck with producer extraordinaire. Often imitated, never duplicated the real Jay Mack. And look, let me tell you something. This man does his job extremely well. You know, so I am I am blessed 
to have him on the team. And look, I know some of y'all out there, y'all trying to lure my man away. Keep, keep, stay away. Stay away. Nah, but I'm grateful to have J Mac, a man in the controls for this program. Now, to the word of God, we go. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is a portion of scripture that I think in some ways is misunderstood, and in other ways, I think the gravity of it is intentionally obfuscated. And intentionally avoided. And what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, let's read the text first. Then we'll get into it. The Apostle Paul penned this epistle to the, to the Christians at Rome, the saints of God at Rome, in the city of Rome during the first century. And the word of God says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A couple things I want to say. Whether we recognize this or not, the word of God instructs us that the way that we manage our bodies is an exercise of worship. It certainly includes the way we use our bodies in physical intimacy. Contrary to popular practices, sexual immorality is still sin. Fornication is still sin. Adultery is still sin. The Greek term for sexual immorality is porneia, where we get our English word pornography from. So it includes consuming material, digital, print, or otherwise for purient interests, P-R-U-R-I-E-N-T. It includes that. It also includes the way that we manage our bodies. Now, you're not going to get me to join any legalistic trains. You can't eat this, you can't eat that. But I will say that it is, it is not the will of God for us to abuse our bodies by what we do to it, and by what we put into it, what we consume. The way we navigate the body, our bodies, is an aspect of our worship to God. We have to take this into strong consideration. Strong consideration. Because, unfortunately, people have misunderstood and therefore misapplied the concept of God's grace. God's grace is sufficient. He forgives for sin. His forgiveness, however, is not a license for you and me to live lifestyles of, lifestyles of rebellion and then chalk it up to, well, you know, God had, God's grace covers that. There's a distinction between a person who may be struggling in an area and a person who was intentionally, you know, marching like a, you know, a, a southern band drum major high step in rebellion. Those are very different. Furthermore, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The transformation that, tra that takes place from being dead in trespasses and sins and to be quickened together and quickened alive together in Christ Jesus to newness of life includes our minds being transformed. To say it differently, that our minds, we must think differently. There's a way that the unbeliever thinks, and there's a way that we should think now that we are born again. Which means that God has placed the affirmative responsibility on all believers to refuse to passively imbibe the narratives and ideologies and messages that the world continues to pump our way. But we apply the trade of the believer to think biblically about everything. About everything. I know what's going on in the world. I know this third wave feminist movement has completely denigrated and degraded our men and our women. To where women now celebrate <laughs> sexual promiscuity 
as evidence of their liberation. <laughs> I read in a book once. I believe it was Orwell's 1984 when he said society will be transformed into mass slavery, yet the slaves will love their chains. I'm just going to say it very plainly. You can't have casual physical encounters and, and leave unaffected. I'm just telling you straight up. I'm just telling you straight up. The world tells you differently, but let me just, one is lying and one is true. The believer's opportunity and responsibility is to examine these things in light of Scripture. The same thing applies to our view of children. Do we really believe life is sacred? Do we really believe that? Like, for real, for real, do we really believe that? Or is it something we are comfortable saying, but when you get right down to it, to brass taxes, eh, we don't really believe it that way. And I don't know why I keep going back to this, but I'm, I'm going to say something now that unfortunate is it'll be controversial in this day and age. Um, physical intimacy is a gift from God and it's enjoyable, but it's not a basic need. <laughs> you won't die without it. You don't have water. You don't have food. Those are foundational needs. I'm saying all of this because the unfortunate reality is that the world, instead of, let me say it differently, the Lord said that he deposited his church in the world to be the pillar and ground of truth. The body of Christ has been in, in, invested into the earth, into the world, into the societies and communities where God has placed us so that we would influence them. But what's happening, unfortunately, is the opposite. The world is influencing us. It, it is reducing the body of Christ to the notion instead of, as it was articulated on the day of Pentecost, what must I do to be saved? The body of Christ is often taking the posture out. What can I do? How far can I go? Yet still maintain my fire insurance. In a lot of ways, we just have to become worldly. But by God's grace and my prayer for this program today, generally and this segment right now, will serve as a stimulus to invite you to think again. I pray that the Spirit of God would convict us, all of us, of the ways and the areas that we've allowed the world to begin to shape our perspective. That term, do not be conformed to the world. It means to be squeezed into the mold of something that you are not, following the pattern of another, following the pattern of something that you are not. In many instances, we've allowed the world to squeeze the church into its pattern. You know, I don't think, I know some, some people might be thinking about thinking I am, I don't think I'm a curmudgeon or an old fuddy-duddy. You know, it, it's always funny when, when I travel, people are often shocked when they meet me and say, oh, you're much younger than I thought you were. <laughs> like, I guess I come off like an old man, I guess. I don't know. Um, but let me tell you something. Right and truth is not contingent upon age. The word of God is the ultimate arbiter of truth. We as believers have the responsibility having, as a result of having the spirit of God indwelling us with the privilege of having our minds renewed to re-examine and rethink everything in light of God's word. That is what our lives should be characterized by, continuously striving to be more and more and more like Christ. And that striving it's not like it's a Herculean effort. I deadlift 315, now I'm going to deadlift 425. It is actually developing the lifestyle habit of yielding to the Spirit of God's conviction with consistency and immediacy. When you were younger in the faith, maybe the Lord had to tell you two or three times, kind of like parents correcting children. But at some point, maturity should set in to where our Lord only has to tell us one time. And we respond with rejoicing eager to obey because we know the instructions and commands of our God are not grievous. Actually, they put us in a posture to enjoy this side of eternity with anticipation 
of what is to come. Whether it's a story about prayer in public schools or battles for biblical truth within our denominations, the American Family News Network is here to tell you what the newsmakers are saying. We are starting to see a rebellion against corporate America's endorsement coddling of the LGBTQ agenda. The American Family News Network is comprised of news anchors and editors that team up to bring you news from a Christian perspective. A TRO for non-legal types out there uh, is basically just an emergency order that would have allowed Liam to go back to school wearing the t-shirt he wants to wear. And again, that t-shirt says there are two genders. Not only can you listen to reports on the radio, but you can also visit AFN.net for coverage of the latest headlines. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis out on the campaign trail was ready with an answer on the meaning of the word woke. American Family News, reporters you can trust. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, we're different. We have different parts to play, mm. but there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or yeah. their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We no. don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. I am elated to have in studio with me. Uh, I am honored, privileged. I'm always uh, encouraged by you all. Uh, Co-hosts of Hannah's Heart, which can be heard right here in American Family Radio on Saturdays. Saturdays at 5 p.m. Central. Um, Ann Cockrell. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Kendra White. Hello. Thank you for having us on. I didn't tell you I was going to say your last names, but I'm um, all right. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, man, I'm so grateful to have you on the program and really also grateful for the journey that the Lord has brought you mm-hmm. on personally and individually. And then you two coming together uh, to do the, the program, Hannah's Heart, which is such a vital, vital uh, need in this day and age. And so mm-hmm. I want to start with you, Anne. All right. <laughs> to share a little bit about Hannah's Heart and what your program focuses on. And how the Lord gripped you uh, to start this program to invite others into this wonderful yeah. world. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having us on. And I will say this is new information, or new-ish, mm-hmm. that we also air on Sundays at 11 a.m. now. Mm. And so we were excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, so Hannah's heart, my husband and I, my husband Will, um, and I struggled with infertility for almost four years before we ever had a successful um, pregnancy. And uh, we had multiple miscarriages. We have um, six miscarriages. That was not all before Hannah's heart. That has happened some during Hannah's heart as well. Um, But during that time, I worked from home and it was the most lonely feeling I've ever had just Mm. being at home. And at that time, I really didn't know of other women, especially my age, that were longing for babies, Mm. but that couldn't have babies. Mm. All of my friends, I had wonderful friends, but they were all, you know, having those baby showers and welcoming babies home. And I was at the Mm. hospital for all of those Mm -hmm. births. And, you know, uh, it was just a a lonely, lonely time. Even though I got to love on those babies, it just was a reminder of what I was not getting to experience. Mm. And um, as we were seemed to be losing every baby that I got pregnant with and they couldn't figure Mm. out why. Um, And so Walker one day, um, I still don't know why, I guess the Lord just placed it on his heart, called Will and was like, hey, I don't know if Ann would ever want to work at AFA, but 
there's a job. And so um, I accepted that position, I think, within like 24 hours, mm-hmm. came up here for an interview, and it had nothing to do with radio. I talked to donors and um, worked in donor support. And then when I was here, I went to Wesley, and I just went to him with an idea. I was like, hey, I think the Lord has just laid it on my heart. This is right before COVID. Mm-hmm. Um uh, just laid on my heart, you know, that this could be a neat ministry for AFA to have. I don't think right now that we have anything like it. And he was like, all right, let me know what you think of, you know, whatever. And I was like, no, 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 no. Just like one idea for you, (laughs) one of you other radio hosts, you know, like somebody else that's qualified. I have an idea for someone else to do. (laughs) That is, um, what I went into his office that day for. And so, um, anyway, yeah. And then it ended up being me (laughs) and, um, Um, uh, we've had a sweet, I don't even call her a guest, Jade, Mm -hmm. who has been on the program, who filled in for me for a a long time after we lost our sweet baby boy last year, Jade was on the program, Mm -hmm. um, for me for months. And so I can't, I can't call her a guest anymore. She's one of us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, but she came on and me and her and she introduced me to Kendra Mm -hmm. and um so we just formed I almost just say a family or Mm -hmm. little sisterhood of unfortunately struggling through infertility Mm. and um but God has brought so much beauty from those ashes of walking Mm. through those lonely days and Hannah's heart I got into it and talked to Kendra and Jade about it, thinking I wanted to be help for other women and be there for other couples. Mm -hmm. And it has totally turned around and been what I needed. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's been amazing how the Lord has used Hannah's heart and like me having to study up on things and then using the people that we've interviewed and the listeners Mm -hmm. and people Mm -hmm. just here at AFA being so encouraging. Um, And it's been amazing. Like once you get your story out, how people flood in Mm. and either just flood in on your behalf praying Mm -hmm. or flood in saying like, I'm going through the same thing. I had Mm. no idea. And so just hands hearts Mm -hmm. a blessing to Mm -hmm. me. And so I'm just so thankful for the friendship that Kendra and I have developed and uh, Jade and I have developed um, through walking a lonely, lonely Mm. road together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And it's not something that you, um, you know, oftentimes, uh, people will share things that I have overcome in my past. This is something oh, you're yeah. living through you oh, know, yeah, and, yeah. and you continue to live through. And uh, it's, it's funny, not funny, but Jade is actually Jeff's yes. <laughs> sister. <Shout out. laughs> so she was uh, <clears throat> successful in getting rid of Jeff. And I'm, finding- <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it, it, it is um, a, a vital, 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 a vital ministry in an area that is often uh, not addressed, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I'm so grateful that you all stepped into that area Thank and are you. able to support uh, families and yeah. women all over our country experiencing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Kendra, what was your journey? Yes. To join Hannah's heart. So um, my husband, I met when I was a little older in life. I <laughs> waited and waited and kept trusting the Lord, and his timing is perfect and so great. And I love my husband, Eric, so much. Um, he is a man after God's heart. He, um, I can I can vouch for that. Uh, yes. we When we were actually dating, went over to y'all's <laughs> house to ask you some marriage wow. questions. Yes. We were I, watching I y'all very close. Well. I remember very well. <laughs> Trying to figure that whole thing out, but um, well, I think you're great too. Sorry, I don't ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we um, anyways, just in praying uh, about what marriage would look like for us. My husband is a um, paraplegic, so he had a car accident when he was 15, um, and wasn't sure how that would affect his ability to have children. Mm-hmm. So when I was praying about marrying him, knowing that in on the front end was scary because I just knew that I wanted to be a mom. I've mm. always wanted to be a mom. And then um, this he was the first person I really had a serious relationship with mm. and like start, you know, feeling these attachments and Lord, why would you call me to be with somebody if, you know, we can't um, mm-hmm. have a family? And then the Lord just really working on my heart and him just saying, do you trust me? Mm-hmm. Do you trust me? And not, I didn't feel like the Lord told me, I'm promising you biological children. I just right. felt like the Lord was saying, Will you trust me in this? And mm. so I was like, yeah, Lord. And, and you know, just um, the Lord uses in your life whatever um, whatever he can to sculpt you and mm. to make you like Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I think a, t- a lot of times about how, you know, a potter, when he's working with clay, he has all the different tools that he can grab and use. And 
any craftsman will tell you that if you work with a dull blade or a dull tool, it's not efficient. It's not great. You need the sharpest blade you can to accomplish the task that you need. Mm -hmm. And, um, I took a class in pottery and God just blew my mind. But <laughs> infertility for me was the tool that God used to just shave out of my life a lot of idolatry, mm -hmm. um, of, you know, even making motherhood an idol yes. and um, anything that, you know, you desire more than God is an idol. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just really having to say, Lord, you're number one, you sit on the throne. And even if I never have a bio biological child, I know mm -hmm. that you're good to me. So the Lord really used that to transform me. And I, of course ended up saying yes to my husband. He proposed in a hot air balloon and he said he's going to kick me out if I said no. <laughs> so I quickly said yes, landed safely. Um, but yeah, you know, as we started going throughout our journey, I know there's a lot of talk in the media right now about IVF. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, My husband and I tried several other um, routes first and we were told that IVF would be our only option for building a family. And so I started doing my research to say, well, what is it? You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'd heard about some of the ethical problems of there being excess frozen embryos through the mm -hmm. traditional IVF protocol. And so um, we actually came to a place where I felt like our um, fertility journey of having um, biological children came to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I've been pro-life and <laughs> have stood on the word of God my whole life. I can't change what I believe now because mm -hmm. of this great desire. Um, and so, you know, it was... Um, a sad time of processing what could this look like and of course you know we were open to the idea of, of adoption and I think adoption is such a beautiful we talk about it on the show all the time sure, and absolutely. I've heard some of the most incredible stories of how God can place that desire into mm -hmm. couples hearts but when you are struggling with infertility it's not a band-aid for wanting to have a biological right. child you have to mm -hmm. process that hurt um, yeah. and disappointment first yeah. um, so anyways long story short um, we ended up finding about um, a method um, called natural cycle IVF mm -hmm. or um, minimal stimulation IVF um, and found a fertility clinic that was willing. Um, it's uh, run by Christians mm -hmm. and they were um, a non-discard facility. They were all the things that we had concerns about. And um, we were able to, now we had to travel six hours to go find a clinic that offered all of this. Um, but through that, we ended up um, conceiving my gorgeous little daughter who's waving at me through the glass <laughs> right now, Eliana Joy Knox. <laughs> and um, yeah, we're just beyond blessed to have her. Praise God. And I definitely want to get into the IVF conversation. But before we do that, um, I wanted to just talk a bit about your reactions. And I'll, I'll talk mm -hmm. Pitch this over to Anne because before you guys came in the studio, uh, we were just going through the scripture in Romans about the necessity for the believer uh, that it actually it's a mandate from God. Do not be conformed to this world, mm -hmm. but be transformed by the mm -hmm. renewal of our minds. And oftentimes, uh, Christ followers fail to include the cultivation of the mind yes. mm -hmm. in our discipleship process and as a part of us being sanctified, which means we'll think differently. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. we're required to think about things differently and about things that we may not have thought about before, but also to think differently being anchored by the scripture. And so uh, in addition to that, we've been talking and my wife was on the show last week mm -hmm. uh, because we're at a place where there's a demographic crisis in the United States of America and in the entire Western world because we're not having children at replacement rates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has transpired since Roe, thanks be to God, has been filed into the dustbin of history. That's right. And it's a tender case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, we've seen the rise of these state ballot initiatives mm -hmm. where p states across the country, uh, even in places like Kansas, <laughs> Ohio, to where they're enshrining the right to kill children in their constitutions, mm -hmm. state constitutions. So when you hear about all of that and know your own journeys and and kind of contrast this, this desire for family and children with the culture seeming revulsion for yeah. children and family how does how do you how do you navigate that uh, to be honest it, for me personally where i am in life right now we had a 26 week old baby last july who passed away 30 minutes mm -hmm. after he was born and so honestly when i hear the stuff it hits harder now. I mean, mm -hmm. it's always abortion has mm -hmm. always hit hard. I wrote George Bush a letter when I guess I, I don't know I was like eight or nine years old because I saw I think it was actually um, from AFA's magazine that my parents <coughs> mm -hmm. got in the mail these days. My my mom had left it in the bathroom, mm -hmm. and there's a picture of an abortion clinic throwing out 
babies. Mm. They were in um, garbage bags, and they were mm. throwing them in the dumpster in the back. And I just went out to my mom and cried and cried because mm. I, I didn't know what that was at the time. Mm. And so then she explained that to me, you know, in the best way that you could to, I guess, an eight or nine-year-old. Mm. And so abortion's been on my heart for a long time. I actually worked at a pregnancy center here in town before I worked at AFA, Parkgate Pregnancy Center, um, and would see so many young ladies, so many parents, honestly, against them adopting their babies out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they could go get that baby aborted. Like that—that that was one of my last mm-hmm. days in office because I was struggling with infertility at the time. And um, a young girl had come in, and after she had seen the ultrasound, she made her decision she didn't want to get mm-hmm. an abortion. And her mom in the office said, "You're not adopting this baby out. This is our blood. You're getting an abortion." And that's it. I mean, it. Our office shook that day. Mm-hmm. Because it's so heartbreaking. And when you see my beautiful 26-week-old baby boy, his fingers were perfectly formed. He had mm. long eyelashes. I mean, just he was perfect. Yeah. And um, and so to think that people even fight for abortions past that age, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's heartbreaking because we know of so many families right now that would do anything mm-hmm. to take that baby mm-hmm. off your hands, you know, and I, that's even a sad way to put it. But sure. like, if that's a problem to you, there's people who would love to help you fix that problem. Um, and that would fix a problem for them, you know. Mm-hmm. But instead, yeah, we have states trying to pass these legislators to literally take life away. And it's something worth fighting for Mm -hmm. we you know we have people saying that we need to help these with women's rights and all that nonsense but yet we're not helping parents to adopt Mm -hmm. children like where does the church need to stand in that there's Mm -hmm. there's a gap somewhere that we're missing yeah Kendra um and I'm fighting back tears over here (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) I know this is a loaded question, and we don't have enough time to go into all of the details, but just if you can, as best mm-hmm. as you can, it, it, do you think it's a deficiency in education? Mm. Do people are unaware, or is it far more mm. worse, far worse, more It's so hard that? not knowing people's hearts. You know, I'd like yeah. to say it's education, but at yeah. the end of the day, either you believe that life begins at conception or you don't. Yeah. And the ramifications of that statement, I encourage anybody listening to go watch on YouTube. There is a, a video where you could, there is, um, it's a little zinc that is um, emitted and a light burst that happens when conception happens and a unique DNA is formed. So yeah. either you believe that and it's scientific or you don't. Yeah. And, you know, when we, we get into the talks about IVF, like, you know, I find it interesting that so many Christians have been pro-life their whole life, mm-hmm. but they make these, you know, these concessions, these exceptions because of people. And it's always, it's, you know, it's, it's the same as any issue that the church is facing where we're um, faltering. It's, mm-hmm. I know someone and we get this emotional element, but yeah. emotion should have no, you know, bearing on whether or not the word of God is true. And it, and it's, and it's not as if we, we want, you know, some people who are politically conservative say things like facts don't care about your feelings we're humans so we're going to have emotions Mm -hmm. but our emotions are not the final arbiter they're not the ultimate arbiter of our course of action decision making shouldn't be governed by emotion emotion. primarily or solely that emotion has to be subjected to the cognitive ability and the volitional and simply put the truth like you mentioned there's a scientific reality Mm -hmm. that transpires when egg and sperm come together new life is formed dna encoded at the cellular level at the atomic level uh, those are scientific facts and so to believe or not believe really is a question whether or not you're really really informed by truth or you're going to employ blind faith to deny the truth Mm. more when we come back here on the hamilton corner sadly as believers we can be Pretty self-centered and selfish about our prayers, praying for I, me, mine. The Lord taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father. Not just simply my Father, but our Father. We need to pray much daily for each other and pray with one another as well. That's so, so very important for each and every one of us. Tune in to the Hour of Intercession, weekdays at 3 a.m. Central on American Family Radio. 
Are you being honest and dependable in your personal money matters? Honesty is one of the first things Jesus requires of new believers. When some tax collectors approached Jesus to be baptized, they asked, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. You need to be honest to be effective for God's kingdom work. Tune in to Faith and Finance with Rob West. Weekdays at 9 a.m. Central on American Family Radio. Sometimes shortcuts are not wise. If that's true physically, how true that might be spiritually. I think all of us have shortcut stories, you know? (laughs) But there's some you don't want a shortcut when it comes to getting to God, do you? There is no shortcut to God. It's only through Jesus. Exploring Missions with Bert and Nathan Harper. Saturday afternoons at 2.30 Central and Sundays at 1 Central on American Family Radio. A love for Christ needs to be the believer's motivation in life. He's the creator and sustainer of life, giving us life and breath. And he has provided a way for us to be reconciled to him through what his son did for us on the cross. And having all of that transform our hearts to love him. The Christian Worldview, 8 a.m. Central Saturdays on American Family Radio. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. My guests, the double duo that make up, that comprise Hannah's Heart and Cockrell, Kendra White. Uh, we're having a conversation that I think is necessary, not just over the airwaves, but really at kitchen tables, in homes, in living rooms, around fireplaces, in the projects, no matter where you are. This is a conversation that should, should uh, be engaged in because we either believe life is sacred or we don't. And there are a lot of red herrings that are employed. There are a lot of euphemisms that are employed to try to conceal really barbaric attitudes Mm -hmm. concerning human life, innocent Mm -hmm. human life. Um, As you mentioned before the break, Kendra, one of the things that's in the news now is in vitro fertilization, Mm -hmm. you know, and political pundits and candidates and all are throwing their barbs and they're using this as an issue to get elected or to defeat their opponents and all this Mm -hmm. other kind of stuff. And there are a lot of Christians in the middle that maybe have not thought about these issues and are many, unfortunately, are um, eagerly, zealously, and ignorantly arriving at unbiblical positions. So I'm mm-hmm. just going to call it like it is. So if like you could, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, I've been known to do that a little bit, you know. I, you know, um, In vitro fertilization, acronym used most commonly, IVF, what is that? All right. So um, this is where it's important for couples to know the um, traditional um, protocol of what IVF is. And um, uh, there's a lot of different ways that IVF can be formed. But the the very first IVF was something called a natural cycle IVF. Mm -hmm. Um, They went and they took um, a woman's egg. Um, They were able to go in and retrieve that in a dish um, where we get the phrase in vitro fertilization means in the the glass dish. Mm -hmm. Um, They uh, were able to fertilize it and then transfer it back into her and it implanted in her uterus and she had the very first IVF baby. So in essence, that's where IVF started. Um, And I think this is in 1978, right? Yes, sir. Oldham, so, England. Yes. So what? And I noticed you said it though. So, Sorry, the child. I well, don't no, know no, 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 singular, plural, yes. you know, not plural egg. Was, was, yes. um, Which is significant for this conversation. It is very significant because That's IVF very and the traditional protocol changed over the years. Um, and they realized, oh, wow, you know, this is a lot to have the procedure to go in and get this egg. So what if we gave the woman some medication to stimulate her ovaries um, and the follicles to develop more eggs and release more eggs? And we can, you know, kind of um, retrieve more. We have more to work with because sometimes um, and this is something that I do think. This issue isn't completely black hat, white hat, like Christians need to understand the science. There is a natural process in the human reproductive system of um, 
cells dying and DNA, like sometimes um, it's not unique to IVF, but Mm -hmm. um, it is really truly a miracle when a a baby is formed. And at every stage of human development, there are things that can go wrong and stop happening. And that's not unique to IVF. That happens in a lot of women's bodies and they never even know that they've miscarried. So that is important to know. But so they thought because of this loss of human life along the way, let's start with the more the better. Um, But then they would fertilize multiple eggs and it has gotten to a point where I think the average IVF cycle is around 14 eggs that they try to retrieve and collect, but there are some that go as high as 40 eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, So then what typically happens now, um, so let's say they get 14 eggs um, retrieved and they fertilize them and 12 of them end up fertilizing. Um, And so now you've created an embryo. That spark happened. That zinc was emitted. Light Mm -hmm. came. That is a human created in the image of God. And and let's let's be clear, and I know we don't have as much time as I would like to have, but When you have an egg that is fertilized, you have the conception of life. And that human is still created in the image of God, even if there were doctors involved. And I think that's That's important, too, when we're in this, because there have been some people putting... IVF babies into a whole different class of human beings. There are no classes of human beings. There is one class and you're created the image of God. That's kind of an issue we've had to (laughs) encounter at many different levels. Yes. Very much so. Classes of human beings. You know, my husband and I, having gone through this process with our family personally, um, it's an, an issue that we've become very passionate about, but we recognize that even if there is artificial reproductive technology involved, that God is still the author of life. Mm -hmm. Um, The the doctors can do whatever they can to help um, make the environment appropriate, but only God can make that spark happen. That's exactly right. And so there is an aspect of, I think if, if the Lord calls couples to do it in a way that is God honoring, where you can still acknowledge him as Mm -hmm. the creator and author of life. But anyway, so let's say they have these 14, 12 fertilize and become humans. Um, So now which, um, you know, which ones do we transfer? So they send them off for genetic testing. This is another issue that's wrong with the IVF protocol. So they biopsy these little teeny tiny embryos. So they're literally, literally taking a little piece of that off, sending it off, and then they can come back to you and say, well, what color do you want your kids to have? What, do you want a boy or do you want a girl? Oh, by the way, these ones are gonna, they have markers that could lead to Down syndrome, so mm-hmm. they're abnormal. We're not even gonna give you, some some places won't even give you the option. They won't transfer them. Nope, sorry, they're gonna, you know, they have a list of possible. And, mm-hmm. and they some- They mess up their numbers. Yes. So they don't want their statistics to be right. affected by this. So the genetic testing is amazing. Major problem that I think Christians should have. And when you say there's statistics, what do you refer? There's statistics for successful implantation, right? Because right. if their success rates look like they go down, they might not make as much money. They might not get grants. They might anything that could potentially help them financially. Exactly. So they want to say one cycle of IVF. That's why we want to have 20 eggs to work with right. because we were successful this cycle because we had 20 tries. But they're also not documenting the ones that passed away. Mm-hmm during the genetic testing process or yeah. the ones that were not ever transferred, you know. Um, exactly. So it, it is It is really sad because genetic testing in turn, it could literally be the reason why, why that a child, child doesn't dies. Live. Well, yeah. and with genetic testing, there's a couple things that um, science uh, disagrees with the way the typical IVF protocol mm-hmm. is because um, some of these markers um, will say that it's abnormal, but they have proven that if left alone, some of them will change and will go on to be perfectly normal, healthy babies. And what's normal? And, you know, right. but um, will completely be healthy and they'll yeah. change in utero. Um, that's because they're biopsying the um, placenta, not the actual. Um, embryo part. Yeah. Um, and so there's a connection there. And then some of them can be killed or harmed in the process yeah, of you are just so determined that you want to only have boys or not have a baby with Down syndrome that um, in the process of them doing that biopsy, the the child is killed. Yeah. Um, that happens. So um, first problem is the, is the problem of having too many embryos created and not having a plan for what to do with the extra embryos. Second problem is this genetic testing that often goes. The third problem is something called selective um, reduction. reduction. Thank you. So they might say, okay, we have five normal embryos. So we're going to put all of them in you in hopes that at least one of them will implant and continue to grow. Um, and statistically, they probably won't all, but let's say they, they, they do that. And maybe it's a woman who's a little older. So they're like, our time's running out. So let's put five embryos in you. But let's say she beats the odds and all five of them implant in her uterus. Well, now you have a problem of a very unhealthy pregnancy that could risk the mother's life yes. and the baby's. So they say, okay, we're going to go in and we're just going to reduce it. 
You know how they use the word reduce? Yeah, kind of like the people who say that in order to have a sustainable planet, we need to go from 6.7 <laughs> billion mm -hmm. down to, I don't know, 500, maybe a billion. Mm -hmm. But we'll do it civilly. That kind of reduction? That kind of reduction. That's <laughs> we're exactly just right. use the fancy word reduction to mean murder. To mean yeah. we're going to go in and we're going to murder some of your babies. Yes. So you would not have that problem if doctors would be responsible about how many embryos are being transferred. And Anne, I don't know if you want to share some of the other countries that have better laws in place. Do you want to share that? So Italy and Germany are the two that we for sure know about that have these better laws that you can get criminally criminal charges placed against you if you do um, put it transfer mm -hmm. more than I think two. Mm -hmm. Um, any that you would uh, and that makes not selective end up reduction using. not even a, a problem, right? Because right. you can help carry carry too. It's criminal to transfer. Yeah, if they're not going to be you, if you're embryos. if the lady knows that she is not going to be okay with triplets or quadruplets, you know things like that. Yeah. Um, Do they also put limits on how many um, can embryos can be created? Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they put. I, I can't remember the number of eggs that they'll limit, but like I'm pretty sure it's no more than four eggs yeah. that they'll even take out. And um, it's remarkable because people, in, in, and I, I just played on my show earlier this week, a video from Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks say, going on a rant of rants. You know, say, I don't believe in your Bible, your oh mythical gosh. book, and, and I'm not going to let that control. It seems like. We either believe life is life or we mm -hmm, don't. We, mm -hmm. we can't have this hopscotch about it. And the reality is that we should be ashamed of ourselves as a nation mm -hmm. when you have nations like Italy and Germany who not only recognize that a conceived child is a, is child, a child, but yeah. will criminally prosecute. I want to say that again. We'll cr for, for, for Governor Kay Ivey in Alabama, will criminally prosecute That's you right. for creating a baby to kill it, yeah. to kill him or her. That's right. And for those that don't stand on the word of God, I wish you would at least look at the science yes. and see um, when life begins. But also there are so many benefits to a more natural approach from a scientific standpoint. So mm -hmm. the, the drugs that they give you to stimulate, I mean, God did not intend for our ovaries to produce 40 eggs in one cycle. And if you talk to anybody who's gone through some of the regular stimulation of, of IVF protocols, it is very difficult mm -hmm. on a it's woman's body. It's very hard on, on And it can, you can have something called, um, I think it's hyper ovarian yep. syndrome. Am I saying that right? But um, where their abdomen will just swell, swell. up and yeah. it can cause so many problems. And they're finding that there's a lot more success rates that quantity doesn't necessarily mean quality yes. in, in eggs. And it's, it's just interesting to me to always see the creator's beautiful design always coming back to being yeah, what works yeah. <laughs> the most efficiently. And one of the major reasons I wanted to have you guys on to talk about this is to do just that, to encourage people to investigate. I know I, I'm I'm a very passionate person and, and I don't I don't want my passion to impede anybody listening mm -hmm. uh, f from their inquiry. Mm -hmm. Search out the issue mm -hmm. right. before you Render your opinion concerning IVF, you know, because I've heard all kind of pundits. Oh, we should be in favor of life, more life. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What is life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, what, what defines it? Where does it start? Where, where, where does it end? What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is that many people who have been advocates for pro-life policy, mm -hmm. you're beginning to find when it's not politically expedient, That's correct. that <laughs> policy advocacy changes right. based on, you know, putting the, the finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. Yeah, say who yeah. you're talking to. Yeah, yeah, and then make a determination where you're going to stand on it right. before you offer your, your One opinion. One thing that I have heard with as we've been learning more about this Alabama ruling and IVF, um, someone brought up the point, us as Christians, conservatives, Republicans, whatever you want to call yourself, if you're sitting here listening to AFA, you're more than likely in some that of that <laughs> demographic. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, if we want to get upset about women taking the abortion pill, yeah, because that's life, because she had just aborted, you know, but took that pill and we view that as an abortion mm -hmm. or the plan B pill, then we have to have that same stance for these babies in these Petri dishes. And I know that sounds like a silly way to put it, 
But it's like we're trying to make that not seem as bad. Yes. Because they're in a petri dish instead of in a woman's uterus. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which which mm-hmm. follows the, the the model for mass carnage. Whenever there mm-hmm. has been mass murder, mm-hmm. whether it's Hitler's Germany, which you have six million Jews, not only Jews, another five million people were non Jews. Mm-hmm. Those who were infirm, those who were elderly, those who who didn't fit the the Nazi shtick for the Superman. They were mm-hmm. uh, they were exterminated. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Same thing with with Islamic jihadists. They view the people they murder as non-human, right. mm-hmm. as the kafir, as the infidel. The same thing with the horrors of the, the, the trans-Saharan slave trade and its progeny, the transatlantic slave trade. Mm-hmm. This is a separate category of something. It is yeah. the consistent phenomenon to where we otherize, we stigmatize, and we categorize humans into different strata for annihilate the Rwandan genocide, the exact same thing, yeah. to where Hutus describe Tutsis as mm-hmm. cockroaches and mm-hmm. all of these things over and over and over again. It's the same playbook, mm-hmm. and it's happening again currently, right. mm-hmm. but yeah. we're not identifying it as such. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that if there's any clinics that are currently operating under the idea that life begins at conception and you're in Alabama, then you, nothing about the way you operate has to has change. To change. Nothing. And that's what people need to understand about IVF. Like the word we need to be hearing more about is how it needs to be reformed and yes. changed. So we're thinking, you know, in, in extremes, but there, I do believe that there are ways that IVF can be done that are life affirming. And not, not every Christian feels comfortable with that or yeah. is called to that. For those that don't feel comfortable at all with artificial reproductive technologies of any kind, there's something called um, NAPRO technology, natural reproductive um, technology um, that you can go research. A lot of our Catholic brothers and sisters have done a ton of research to actually go to the problem. Rather, IVF a lot of times is a um, runaround. It's like a, a we don't know why you have this unexplained fertility, but we know that we can do this and it could work. So let's just try it. Mm. Um, but sometimes it doesn't go to actually diagnosing problems. So the NAPRO technology yeah. really works um, to find, let's look at your hormones. Let's look at your diet. Let's look at some of the things that regular fertility clinics aren't taking time. Which we've to help had a with. doctor on who is an, how do you yes, say that? A, a NAPRO, NAPRO doctor mm-hmm. yeah. um, on the show. And she definitely went into more detail. She was talking over my head. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so good though. And it's not, it needs to be discussed. Yeah. I got to interrupt because the disrespectful music has started. <laughs> but maybe I should ask y'all off the air, but could y'all come back next week to continue this conversation? Because I want to get into non-discard facilities, mm-hmm. a bit more details, and maybe talk in more specificity about the Alabama ruling and people who are demagoguing that ruling, mm-hmm. turning it into a political issue, and lots of people who are so-called Republican candidates are running away from the life discussion in total because they don't know how to articulate mm-hmm. very well on the matter. Yeah, let's do it. For sure. We'll be here. All right. 